thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Tiffany. Um, I am a seventh year MSTP student at Ohio State. I'm also the vice president of ABAPS. Um, yeah, so thanks for joining us. I'll let everyone else go. Hello, everyone. My name is Jude Tiffany. I'm uh, going to my G1 year. I also at Ohio State, and I'm also the chief information officer at ABAPS. Hello everyone, my name is Shane Scott and I'm a G2 here at the OIC College of Medicine. And your hey. role, Shane? Oh yeah, I'm the um, chief marketing officer of ABAPS. Sorry, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Um, so today I just, uh, we just made a couple slides, uh, just kind of go over some things that you guys should be thinking about if you've uh, gotten um, a couple of the MSTP acceptances, um, just some things we can, we think it's good to think about um, when choosing a program. Um, and then we really just kind of want this to be open, um, kind of talk to, talk to you guys about kind of where you're thinking, um, something, questions you may have. Um, if you haven't had second look, so we can kind of talk about how ways you can approach second look um, and some questions um, and things you, you can ask when you um, have those experiences. Um, so, According to what I, what I looked up from AMCAS, um, this is a little bit different from when I applied, but I think by April 15th, you guys have to narrow it down to at least three programs um, of, uh, based on the program that you've been accepted to. And then uh, April 30th is the deadline to choose one program uh, that you will matriculate to. So that's it this, this month. So that's coming up in the next couple of weeks. You guys will be making this, this decision. And I know that, um, it's, a, it's kind of a, a huge transition once you, if you get it, start getting acceptances because at first you're applying, like, oh, I hope all these people like me. And then you're like, oh, wait, I have to decide <laughs> what do I actually like and where do I wanna go? Um, so I think these are um, some, of the, some of the big points of, of things you should um, be considering in terms of where you're gonna go, um, just because it's such a, a long process, long is eight years. Um, so all these different things are can really impact your experience through those eight years. Um, so the first one being location. Um, so uh, I think it's good to be reflective on uh, who your support systems are, um, if that's family, if that's friends, um, and how important it is to like be close to those people, um, either like going to a program in the same city or state, something that's like within driving distance, um, but if you're going to an, another side of the country, um, how impactful that can be. And that's, um, I think that's definitely a very personal uh, decision. Um, but as you go through kind of the transitions in the programs um, from med school to grad school, like it's only um, a few other people that are be doing this, this, this track and it can be lonely at times. And so um, knowing and, and being able to at least visit these people um, or seeing people that you know and, and love, I think is really important just for your mental health and just state of being. Um, uh, the second thing is like cost of living. So um, yes, we get med school paid for. Yes, we get a stipend. Um, however, it's not a huge stipend, especially depending on where you're living and especially in the recent years, um, you know, rent prices are going up and so are housing prices. Um, so that can be really um, a huge impact to just kind of your, your well-being, um, thinking about how much rent costs and if you have to live with roommates um, or if you can live by yourself, if you like to live by yourself, um, if you can afford to, you know, have, a, have an animal or a cat or a dog or, or whatever in your apartment. Um, I think that's a, that's a really important thing to ask and, and to see. And I would just ask straight up, like, how much are you guys paying for rent? Um, some people will say like they, you know, they purchased a home. I would dig more into that. A lot of those um, individuals have financial support from their families um, that were able to kind of give them upfront costs for things like that. So I think I wouldn't shy away from asking kind of really direct questions about cost of living, um, especially if you're, you're living in like a big city. Um, and, um, and then just transition to that is a need for a car. So if you like, if you don't have a car now, but you live in a school where you um, you may need a car. I mean, I think most medical schools, maybe outside of like the big ones like Chicago and New York, your third year, which is technically your seventh year in the program, you're probably gonna have offsite 
clinics and things like that you'll have to go to and we'll need a car and um, adjusting that into your cost of, of living with the stipend that you get. And, and Jane and Judy, Judy I can um, jump in if you have anything more to add from the things that I say. Um, the second thing that I think is really important is medical, the medical school curriculum. Um, so um, a lot of students love that, you know, a grading system that's pass fail, especially in the first two years. Um, I think um, some programs will do some type of ranking and kind of understanding where that uh, where that happens. It, it usually happens more so in the third third year clerkships, but understanding kind of what the grading looks like, how often tests are. I know some schools, they like test every week, which sounds to me sounds miserable. Um, <laughs> or they test like in blocks after like a couple, one or two months, you have a test, an exam. Um, and, and if it's, most schools are pass fail, but not all. So that's a really important thing um, to ask about. Um, and then also just this step one and step two passing rate. Um, you wanna make sure that your school is gonna be giving you um, the resources and has proven to be able to get students to pass step one and step two um, fairly well. Um, I think step two in the future, step two is just gonna be more important for you guys, who knows what it was gonna, you know, you'll probably see the aftermath of uh, changing step one to pass fail. Um, and it seems like step two is gonna be more important. And so uh, looking at those average passing scores and uh, making sure that they're like at least um, at the average or above the, av the national average, I think is um, really important. Um, and then a lot of schools with the MD PhD timeline, um, the medical school can be kind of, your curriculum can be a little bit different. So I know at Ohio State, we, we uh, take an extra block. We take one of the blocks at the, at the end of our second year during the summer. So it's a little bit accelerated. Um, some programs will have you do clerkships before you go to graduate school. Um, so there's a lot of different variations. So I would just, um, some people take like step one after their PhD, there's a lot of different variations to that. And so I would definitely ask the students, um, especially like the older students, how they uh, feel about that. Um, and if it was hard and if it was just like how detrimental or how valuable that was to kind of their experience. Um, and then also, uh, so then clinical experiences during your PhD, I think it is pretty valuable to have exposure, especially if it's a, a formalized program to make sure that you are seeing patients and just getting used to um, just being in the in the environment of medicine during your PhD years because um, it just is it just will help coming back in the third year, um, which is where I am now. Um, that I mean the transition is, is challenging regardless, but it's it's nice to know like oh yeah I am I am in medical school I'm going to be a <laughs> a physician. Um, and I think that helps kind of set the stage for a balanced physician scientist career, you know, having clinical experiences during your PhD time. Um, and then I would also ask during second look about assistance in making this transition. So I think most students will say that the transition back into clerkships after your PhD is the most challenging. Um, and so um, asking, um, your program directors and your student and the students in those programs, what they do to help students transition. I think that's an excellent question to ask um, during second look. I can say one thing, sorry, yeah. about the, first about the location and about the curriculum. So yeah. for another thing you should consider, um, so for me personally, I was raised in the kind of a big city environment. So if you're, you know, you're from a big city, maybe, you know, it, it, would you be happy living in a small town? Would you be happy living in a small city? Um, so I was kind of looking for very similar environments that I was raised in like a city environment versus if you're from a smaller environment, you might be more comfortable and going to like a smaller city, you know, kind of more rural environment. So take that into consideration. Also kind of what the school is kind of known for and what they're looking for in terms of you know, like are you trying to train people mostly to go into primary care is that what you're interested in going to primary care um or in, in something else you know what are they kind of known for you can ask those questions as well of them and then just uh just a quick point on the curriculum as well um definitely ask the school if they're like actually pass fail or you know they just uh say they're pass fail because some schools say they're pass fail but they still have 
internal rankings is to have like a certain grading system that are internal. And you, you might be better um, served asking, you know, the students, they might be more willing to tell you just upfront and honest, especially on your second looks. You know, this is what it's actually like on the day on the day to day. So that was great points. Um, and then graduate school, which I think uh, tends to be mo I think when I was applying to graduate school was a little bit more, or at least like what my research was going to be, this was kind of uh, seems to be one of the biggest things that kind of draws you to a program. And so you want to make sure that you have like at least found like one or two labs that you you like. Um, and that they have like funding, um, which is it's a little bit hard at your point in time because you won't join the lab for another like three years. Um, but they have some track record of funding. Um, I think it's also just good to go to programs that have a lot of research opportunities, just in case those labs don't work out, you would have some more opportunities to, to find another lab in case um, a problem arose that you just, you know, wouldn't be able to prepare for. Um, I think it's also important that your MSTP leadership and, and understanding what their role is in your PhD. Um, it's very easy to kind of just get lost. You just go grad school and they kind of lose track of you. It's very easy for that to happen. Um, and what efforts that they're making to make sure that you guys are graduating in three or four years and that that time is not extended and is not, um, it is led by them and not necessarily in, in conjunction with your PI and not just your PI. And um, it is kind of just trying to keep you captive for forever because that can and has happened. Um, and then another good thing to look at is um, uh, getting, so one other thing for your PhD that's, that can be important is securing research funding. Um, uh, one of the main things that a lot of students try to get is apply for the NIH fellowships, the F30 or F31. Um, and so it's trying to see how many um, students they get that are successful in those applications. Um, because a lot of, so part of that application process is kind of the institutional support um, and just kind of like, you basically are trying to give them an idea that you can, um, are gonna be trained really well to be a physician scientist. Um, and that can be proven through um, the institution that you're at. And so that can be kind of reflective of that and the success rate that they have for those programs. Um, there's also other ways to get funding. Um, so like your own institution should have opportunities for graduate students to apply for competitive funding within your institution. And that's those opportunities are really great because if you get those, you can put that on your CV and just show that you have um, been able to secure like a competitive grant. And that's for anyone who wants to continue in academics, that's a really important thing uh, to at least get practice doing as a graduate student. Um, the bit I like to add, especially in the research um, respect is um, choosing a PI is, is very important, right? So you don't necessarily just choose um, PI that, oh, he's doing work that I really, really like. You want to think about, um, in addition to doing work that you really, really like, is he going to be supportive? So if you're the type of person who knows that within the three to four years of your PhD, you may want to travel, you may want to have some flexibility to do some things outside of your, like, graduate school PhD role and maybe let's say you want to be more in depth in you know clinic or something like that and you want to spend maybe two days at clinic instead of um, whatever your school allots you want to know that your PI is going to support you in those endeavors um, again you want to be cultivated as a MD PhD student not as a PhD student because those are two different lifestyles and so make sure that PI understands what your goals are as an MD PhD is to kind of sort of straddle these two worlds um, and that they have like similar ideals. Another thing is that, you know, ask them like, you know, what have your, you know, your students been like in the past? What are your expectations? Um, what have you expected of them? What have they done for you? Um, and that gives you a really good sense of, oh, you know, what hoops you got to have to jump through? What kind of sort of uh, bars the person before you have set? And if it's just a regular PhD, make sure you kind of sort of set the tone of, well, you know, I understand that person was a, you know, just a graduate student and that's why they probably spent five years. You know, you're looking to spend like three to four years. Um, so make sure that's very, very clear. Um, and so don't be afraid to dictate what you want. A lot of schools and institutions, when they get MD, PhD students are super excited because we're a different breed, right? We are unique um, for that purpose. And then as far as like your, your Fs and F31s, et cetera, um, know that you have tons of opportunities to apply for different scholarships. 
before you even like approached a daunting F or F31. And if you're not familiar with those F31 and F30 is, those are usually um, NIH funded um, grants, which are specifically for MD PhD students. And so you'll hear all these acronyms like um, thrown at you, ask what they mean. Uh, it took me a while to ask what they mean. And it's like, oh, now I know that that's what that was all about. So um, don't be afraid. If you don't know the lingo, like just ask. No, I totally agree. Um, I think uh, one question I would have asked, like like looking for PIs, oh, that was a really good point, Shane. Um, I would, you know, when you ask your PI, if you find a PI that you like, I would ask them, have see if they have trained somebody that's doing something that you want to do. Like they have like a trajectory of something. I mean, even if they have a PhD or MD PhD, like if they're doing something that you would want to do, um, I think it's important. Like if you have a PI that all of their graduate students went into industry, which you want an academic career, which was <laughs> ended up being the case for me, um, that can, uh, yeah, that was just something I just like didn't know. So um, it's good to, uh, I think that's a really good question to ask. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Shane. Um, all right, and then uh, this is the second last one is it's just the people. Um, so first, like the leadership. I mean, I think you should um, like somewhat like at least some of the, I mean, so, I mean some directors can be weird. Um, I found that when I interviewed, I found them to be kind of odd, but some of them were really nice. And I liked, um, I think you should like the directors and administrators in your program because like they're, you're going to interact with them for eight years you want to they want they should feel approachable um because you're going to problems and things are going to arise and you want to feel like they're going to listen to you and they hear you and they like kind of know you you know that's kind of up to how open you want to be with them but um i think that's really important and i think you should get a sense that they are supportive of their um urm students right like we're gonna have um some unique challenges and and things that we deal with um, through med school and grad school um, and they need to be you need to feel like a sense that they um, are going to ride for you they're going to like advocate for you um, they're going to connect you to the right people um, and i i would definitely challenge you to ask them these qu questions like this when you go to second look and see what their responses are because i think that will tell you um, and we can talk a little about that later Just some direct questions to ask your leadership to try to tease out um, how supportive they've been in the past and how they hope to be supportive. I think after 2020, there's a lot of language around, you know, um, anti-racism and um, things like that. And sometimes to me, it sounds, you know, it's just like, it's like a hot topic. Um, people are kind of just saying the things that they think they're supposed to say, but you kind of need to, to tease out to see if they're really about those, those actions um, or actions behind those words. Um, and then also just the current students, I would look, I mean, the diversity in the medical school as well as MD PhD program, MD PhD programs just are not going to have a lot of diversity. Um, there's some program, I think it's increasing definitely since I started. Um, but like, you know, diversity and just like personality, like do these people seem like they're um, people that you could get along with? Um, I know that's hard on Zoom. Um, a lot of you guys interviewed uh, virtually. I really don't have a good answer for that, but um, I would also like uh, the people in your cohort, um, like during second look, um, you know, I don't know if they'll have games and, and I think they're, they're trying to make, you know, opportunities for you guys to kind of relate socially. Um, but that, that can be really important because you'll, you'll see these people for a really long time. So it's good to know if you can get along with them. Um, and I already kind of talked about med students. And then I think for, if you're looking for a place where um, diversity is really important for you, I would definitely look at their SNMA program um, um, activities. And then I would probably follow them on social media and stuff and kind of see what they do, kind of activities that they, they hold. Um, uh, and then reach out to, I think those people and, and kind of see, uh, kind of get the sense of how active and how supportive those, those groups are. And I think the, as far as the people situation, like be honest with yourselves, like don't lie to yourself when you think about the type of person you are. If you know that you're a pretty outgoing person, you love to interact with um, your communities, you want to know that that program, again, is cultivating like opportunities for extracurricular, like outings, et cetera. Um, if you're passionate about, you know, photography or if you're passionate about, you know, hiking, 
um, know that there are different like sub niches within your program that is going to, you're going to be able to, you know, have, you know, act out some of those, um, uh, you know, desires that you want to do. Um, and, you know, don't be afraid to like, you know, indulge and really get to know some of the medical students, depending on your program. Some of you guys spend three years with them before you enter your grad school. Some of you spend two years on like, you know, us, we spend like a year and uh, I want to say a year <laughs> um, and a couple months with them. Um, and you get to know them because even after you leave, they're going to be a really good support system. They will know, they will go through the process before you do. And you can collect, you know, gems of ideas of, you know, what not to do when you get to your third year. Um, also, if you like your institution, some of them will stay at your institution. They'll probably be your attendings. And um, by the time you get to that point to be a third year. And so, you know, build those relationships and don't be afraid to, you know, go outside of the, the niche of um, your MD, PhD students. Um, I definitely build a strong relationship with my MD cohort and um, I'm very, very happy. So even in my grad school years, I'm still hearing the stories of the cool stuff they're doing. And like, oh, duly noted. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I can, uh, I mean, right now my, I'm on a gynoc rotation in my, one of my residents is an old classmate of mine. So it's always nice to, to have those interactions and they're like, hey, what's up? You're still in school? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> but it's, it's always nice to see them. And I, I have had really good interactions with my, my classmates from that school. So, um, and the last thing is like, just a, a little tidbit, just as something that I've been thinking about since I'm uh, about to apply to residency. Um, this is like, if you know what resident, like specialty, like residency you wanna go into. Um, if you don't know, that's totally fine. But I was just, I just wanted to put this out there. Like if you do know, um, it could be beneficial to go to a medical school where um, that residence, residency program is strong. Um, this can allow you to um, do research in that specialty. Um, like make connections to um, faculty and just really, um, I mean, I think that's one advantage we have in terms of applying to residency is we have this four year break where there's like time to like build like really strong um, connections and mentorships and people that can write you really strong letters um, that I think some of the four year med students may not have those opportunities. And so um, I just think this is some like some of the more competitive subspecialties are, are usually like the kind of the surgical ones. Um, but that can be that can be just an added um, thing to think about. Um, but if you don't know what you're interested in, it's it's totally fine. Um, but I will say for me, like I was interested in pediatrics and um, I've always been interested in pediatrics. I'm still going to pediatrics. Um, it's not a very competitive specialty, but um, Ohio State has a really nationwide children's. I was able to do my research there, my PhD there, and I've made some really good connections. And I think it's going to put me in a really good spot to apply. Um, and I know kind of things I want to look for in a program because I want to do re research during my residency. And I see how that's set up at a really strong institution. So I know kind of things intimate, more intimately of things to look for in terms of when I apply. But that's just kind of a a thought that I wanted to put out there. Um, this is my last point. Um, so uh, next, I just want to open up to the group. I don't know, Jude, if you want to, or you want to continue recording or? Yeah, so this is where we're going to stop the recording. Um, so for everyone that's going to watch this later, um, feel free to reach out to us at ABAP, ABAPS at aablackps.org uh, with any questions that you have, and we'll be happy to answer them at that point. But we're going to stop the recording here. <laughs>